Monday morning matters. Perspectives from Southeast Asia. This is Arlene. Hi, this is Gauri. Good morning, this is Grace. And of course, you are on our Monday Morning Matters. So That's today, so funny, Arlene, <laughs> about Monday Morning Matters. <laughs> well, it's a lazy Monday, I would say. So, But we want to talk about something that is really serious. Mm-hmm. There is a reality that is happening all over the world. But especially focusing on Southeast Asia, I'm talking about the threats of ISIS and terrorism and how ASEAN is responding towards this. I I guess, uh, first of all, what is our general view on terrorism uh, globally? Globally, when people think about terrorism, they relate to, directly relate to a Muslim or Islamic community. And then that uh, developed from a 9-11 incident that was uh, in 2001, the Twin Tower uh, being crashed and then killing a lot of people on the ground and also on the building itself. And then um, that was from Afghanistan that... um, <clears throat> Al Qaeda was based in that country, and then that attacked the USA. So the relationship between these two countries have gotten worse uh, since then. Actually, speaking of 9/11, that would probably be uh, my first exposure as as a kid to terrorism. You mean you are, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you yeah, are I'm much <laughs> younger than you guys. Uh, How old were you back then? I was 11, in uh, yeah, because it was 2001. And I was uh, only 11 years old back then. And, of course, all these uh, things about terrorism, about war, was uh, pretty uh, new to me. And that was probably uh, the first uh, experience or the first uh, serious news about terrorism that was on TV, that was reported uh, when, the twi- when the planes crashed into the towers. And it was just on TV all night long, I remember. And... All the world leaders were being interviewed, asking, uh, being asked if they had anything to do with the incident. And uh, that's when uh, I realized that this is something that is really serious, that, that something that uh, we don't really talk about that much in Malaysia because we're generally, you know, a very peaceful, harmony Oh, we just country. talk about our stuff too much. <laughs> or, or, or that too. <laughs> well, my first exposure... Uh, to um, terrorism as the way we see it now. Mm -hmm. Of course, when I was a teenager, not as a child, Mm -hmm. because back then (laughs) I wasn't a child anymore. But actually, the acts of terrorism has had, I mean, the kind of um, mass killing has been happening since back way before 9-11. And and, and the concept of suicide bombing is not, a concept started by Muslim terrorists. Actually, it started by, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Hindu terrorists back in the days where Sri Lanka uh, were having Mm -hmm. huge uh, clashes between the Hindus and the Buddhists, uh, or the Sinhalis in this case. Um, Well, what happened after 9-11 was the search in terms of Islamic fundamentalism and the way Muslims see themselves. There were a conflict of uh, uh, identities, I guess, when it comes to uh, how um, the, the West and the Islamic world will clash together. And a lot of culturalists would see this as the clash between Muslim and Christianity or the Western world. But in reality, there's a deeper social economic reason to this. Uh, I, I guess that's the reason why terrorism has been still ongoing until now. And uh, of course, we, what we are seeing right now is the search in a new form of terrorism mm-hmm. since post-Taliban in uh, Afghanistan is a, a kind of terrorism that focuses more on the idea of a state and not any state, but an Islamic state. And it's very interesting that you mentioned that because uh, I think from some of the interviews that we had with some of our guest speakers, most of them said that usually terrorism happens when uh, there's one party that is not satisfied with uh, the government in their country, or it can also be uh, the way some other world leader is treating their community or their people. So it usually starts with that whole uh, dissatisfaction feeling towards uh, towards uh, some uh, political leader. And because they uh, 
they probably tried to to protest to voice uh their feelings or or their opinions and but most of the time of course it can just be brushed off like you're just one guy who cares about your opinion and because of that when there are a whole group of people feeling that way it's so easy for them to come together and form a group and and uh, start uh resorting to more extreme measures Yeah, you are right about it. But you know the problem is uh to define what terrorism is all about is mm-hmm. actually quite problematic because of course you have uh, like cruel acts of violence uh by ISIS members and the Taliban but on the other hand you also have freedom fighters or separatist groups that just want their own independent mm-hmm. state mm-hmm. Or, or their own freedom and in this case even uh the ANC Uh, uh, leader Nelson Mandela he was once branded as a terrorist just because he wanted his country to be independent and to be equal and the same goes with other separatist groups like the southern Philippines uh, uh, Xinjiang, the Muslim uh, Uyghur in Xinjiang mm-hmm. And also uh, uh, the separatist group in Aceh and all other pockets of separatist group which uh, are somehow being misbranded as terrorists uh, probably because they have similar uh, religious values or ideology but doesn't mean they are terrorists in this case. But then uh, talking about terrorists, uh, there's a huge difference between the terrorists and extremists because uh, it looks like Islamic uh, is extremists, they believe in the violence to achieve uh, their ends. So no matter what kind of uh, skills, what kind of technology, what kind of methods they're using to achieve their ends, they have to uh, um, uh, be able to reach their goal. Mm-hmm. via violence mm-hmm. so uh, one of the cases which is 9-11 is the the, the an incident and then they gave that definitely left a huge mark in the society culturally and as well as in the religion mm-hmm. I think ideology play a central role when it comes to like the real reason for terrorism mm-hmm. um, because if you look at a bigger picture uh, the kind of terrorism that I think a lot of the world's government and society are fearing of is where an ideology take over the whole acts of terrorism rather than other reasons altogether. And this goes back to our main focus of today, which is the Islamic State. Uh, the idea of an Islamic State is not new. I mean, during the Iranian Revolution, uh, what um, the... Um, Im- Iranian leader Khomeini was calling for is uh, a, a Republic of Islam. Uh, i- in this case, they successfully formed Iran's Republic of Islam and instituted quite a good uh, form of um, i- uh, Islamic version of of uh, welfare politics, I would say. Um, but but at at the same time, uh, it was also unsuccessful in a way that people feel oppressed, they feel that they don't have freedom of expression, uh, they couldn't uh, exercise their right to be citizens and all that, and uh, politically, religion were being abused on the highest level. So I guess these are one of the limitations of what an Islamic state ought to be. And, 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 and Gauri, how much do you know about the idea of an Islamic state? Uh, from uh, some of the interviews that we've done, it seems that uh, when it comes to the focus of ISIS itself, they felt like it's important to have an Islamic state by itself because that is the way uh, to strengthen their position uh, in the state itself and also to uh, promote uh, Islam as as the ultimate uh, religion uh, for for themselves for the people and also. Uh, a way for to provide the people like a new hope uh, after they're devastated by uh, it's like the political it's a calling, tyranny. Right? Yeah, they make uh, it seem like as if it's a calling by religion, the end goal of Islam. Or is it's an obligation for uh, people who are Muslims uh, that they should feel responsible uh, to create this Islamic state as mm-hmm. as Islam's themselves. There, there's this saying goes that uh, as uh, as a caliph in on earth you know every human beings uh, have the responsibility to mm-hmm. govern uh, uh, the earth natural resources and society so the natural idea is to have uh, a form of uh, islamic uh, 
uh, um, it, I won't say state, but a, 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 an Islamic sort of um, uh, empire or or governance. Mm-hmm. In the past, we of course we have the Ottoman uh, Empire, and we have a few other empires after the death of uh, Prophet Muhammad. But since then, there were you know various pockets of political groups calling for Islamic State, although not as extreme as is uh, ISIS or ISIL. Um, but it 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 is uh, strong enough to be mm-hmm. an ideology on its own. And and I think locally we have PAS, which has been calling for an Islamic State state since the 80s, if I'm not mistaken. It's interesting that you brought that up because uh, that reminds me of. Another interview that we had when uh, the professor was explaining that the main reason ISIS broke away from Al-Qaeda was because Al-Qaeda was more interested in just attacking the nations and not so much about setting up an an Islamic State uh, by itself, which is why uh, this group of people left them and they are now known as the ISIS because they are much more interested in actually coming up with an Islamic state. They felt like that would uh, strengthen uh, their power, strengthen their position even more, as opposed to just attacking and, and hiding. Mm-hmm. But then here, what we need to also remember is the <coughs> just a few months ago, we had this incident in Syria, Israel, and also uh, the Gaza incident that we had, and then that created another uh, sort of um, um, legitimacy, ideology, yeah, towards the especially to to the public, how people can uh, will uh, will be think think about the certain community, for example, Islamic mm-hmm. community, and then that actually has gotten worse after 9/11, and then. They also play with the media, sort of. So they also bought all those, um, the what do you call sympathy from from public to be able to help them out. But actually, the 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 main uh, main event that it itself it's never revealed. Nobody knows what exactly happened. It's the whole media that played after all what it, uh, what happened there. But then the tension between this Muslim and a Christian or Muslim with the other religion is actually getting worse. And then the perception that people are receiving towards the ISIS is also quite scary. It is scary. I mean, considering that, uh, um, I mean, from what we know about ISIS is they seem to be unlike Al-Qaeda, which focuses a lot on the cultural war between the West and the Muslim nation, ISIS actually has quite a strong um, ideological fundamentalism in a way that they know what they want mm-hmm. and their their believers people who believe in ISIS are from the global world that actually come to ISIS uh, in Syria and also in Iraq to fight for the cause which is a, a long term cause and and because of that I think that that's the reason why we are fearing because um, it's unclear how ISIS will take control mm-hmm. the global world and because America is also a country that is so prominent, they're, they're very present. Uh, their presence can be felt, whether it's in America itself or if it's uh, in Asia or um, Middle East. Uh, and in, in a lot of countries, <coughs> they're always present and, and making their, their presence felt for the people. And even uh, with <coughs> ISIS itself, uh, based on uh, some of the articles that I've read, it seems a lot of people uh, blame uh, America for that, that ISIS actually came up uh, to sort of uh, oppose their whole ideology, uh, the same with what uh, Al-Qaeda did, except that they are more extreme in that they are trying to go for a state that is completely different, mm-hmm. that is, they want to establish something that is free from all American uh, influences. And uh, because of all this American occupation that has happened uh, uh, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and all and that that seems to be the the main reason here why people are believing so much in ISIS because they're just so tired uh, of America. Glad that you mentioned that because a lot of the reason why ISIS became such a strong organization from its very you know fragile sort mm-hmm. of uh, beginning mm-hmm. is because of the politics in Iraq and Syria, how the clash uh, or the conflict between the Iraqi Sunnis and Shia actually sustained the legitimacy of uh, ISIS and of course uh, the war in the political war in Syria. 
uh, is one of the reason why ISIS became so popular among the locals. Yeah. And and besides, you know, the ideology of forming a caliph, like what we earlier mentioned, mm-hmm. is also because um, uh, how the internal politics in in Syria and also in Iraq has really sustained. ISIS legitimacy to the to the extent that it's actually pushing towards other nation towards the mm. borders of Turkey, the borders of Jordan and all that. Mm-hmm. And we also see that how economically the global oil market actually um, had advanced the ISIS initial adv- um, strength in the global power to sort of exert the Islamic State. Of course, now the oil prices are going down. So yeah. maybe they might not have the kind of uh, money to sustain itself. Probably that explains why they are doing a lot of ransom. Yeah. Um, 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 what do you call it? The rex- ransom kidnapping of mm-hmm. uh, hostages, like what we see the recent mm-hmm. two Japanese hostages that were being beheaded. So in, in a way, they, they are actually getting stronger as what we've seen. And maybe we can also look at why are they getting stronger. And uh, I think the main reason would be they know how to make use of the social media. Mm-hmm. And they're not using the conventional methods like probably what Al-Qaeda was You mean uh, was they are better than <laughs> us at using social media? But it's also about um, how they are brainwashing mm-hmm. their own people like by educating and by implementing some kind of roles and policies. Like, for example, if you are in the situation, they will mm-hmm. approach you and then they will uh, exchange something with you that you have to go for you have to fight for them so at the end they get what they want and then the, in return you will get what you want <coughs> so it's sort of the exchange policy mm-hmm. that they have been uh, practicing so far so this kind of um uh, policies has been uh, using uh, has been used by uh, in in other countries. For example, even in ASEAN region and also European countries, Australia, for example, it was the one of the the, the very good example that is it's shown. A lot of Australians are involved in the ISIS mainly because of a lot of uh, financial problems or family problems. And then ISIS people they can just approach you without you realizing it's they are actually from ISIS. So that's how you will be involved in that community. And I'm glad you brought that up because when all these people who have problems uh, can be education or job opportunity or whatever it is, uh, ISIS, as we all know, is actually uh, quite well funded and because they are quite... uh, they, they have the funds. It's so easy for them to recruit people and saying, mm-hmm. you know, like what Grace mentioned, if you have a problem, I can just give you this money and in return you just do this for us. And also because uh, according to this article here, most of their postings on their uh Social media pages are all mostly in English and they do have a very good command of English which shows that they are not only targeting the Muslims, they are pretty much going on a global scale, on a mm-hmm. worldwide targeting just about anybody. And in fact, uh, just to add mm-hmm. one point on when you say they communicate in English, even the captor of the hostages mm-hmm. was actually a British Muslim. So it's, it shows that how global it has become and how English-centric <laughs> the mm. ISIS has become. It's not like those kind of primitive Arabic uh, I, um, fantasy that we have yeah. about how the terrorist group would be. And it seems they also have yeah. a very uh, structured, mm-hmm. uh, I, I wouldn't say organization, just maybe a very uh, structured way of administering the whole... In, yeah, in its own. It's a government by itself. It's like a Penang <laughs> government, but there is version. Uh-huh. <laughs> it seems they have their own administration, they have their judiciary, they also have their own army, and their whole operation is is pretty smooth that it's so easy to convince people like you know look at us we're so systematic and organized like what could go wrong that's like, true we, we actually know our stuff and we know what we're doing <laughs> anyway we'll take a short break <laughs> when we return <laughs> we'll talk more about ISIS and about Southeast Asia how they are addressing the issue of terrorism <laughs> Monday Morning Matters Perspectives from Southeast Asia Hey, this is 
Marilyn. Hi, this is Gauri. Hi, this is Grace. And we are back again with our discussion today on ISIS, terrorism and ASEAN. So ASEAN is in the midst of the issue of terrorism because a lot of people in Southeast Asia are actually going on a mission to Syria and Iraq for ISIS, for the sake of ISIS. Um, this is really serious because a lot of them ca- are, are from countries like Singapore, Malaysia, mm. Southern, uh, sorry, Southern Thai, Southern Philippines, and of course Indonesia. And because of that, um, this is actually has it has become not not just a, a country issue, but a regional issue, and it has been discussed even during the talks of the ASEAN Foreign Ministerial Meeting in Kota Kinabalu recently. And also, ISIS is definitely attracting the followers from Muslim communities across the Asia Pacific, that, like Alin, you mentioned, and Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore, and then we can't ignore Australia as well. And then those uh, uh, communities, they have already created by ISIS. They already, uh, the ISIS is uh, planted all those communities in different regions, and that they're focusing now in, in Asia. Mm-hmm. And a lot of countries have come together to uh, this political leaders, they have come up with some uh, ways, some alternatives uh, on how to combat this. Uh, 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 like, for example, Jokowi came out much, much earlier, many months ago, saying that he will do anything he can uh, to actually fight against uh, ISIS and to prevent more Indonesians from uh, getting on board. Najib only and came later, right? <laughs> <laughs> he came later, yes. And uh, if we look at Singapore, uh, they were trying to go for a more educational approach, saying that uh, combating the problem alone is not enough. It has to go down to the education level and to educate people uh, for them to know the real reason why why this is not what they think it is. But and I think I think for now, a lot mm. of the countries in Southeast Asia they are becoming more hawkish mm. because they realize this is a problem that is not just about educating the public, but also putting a stop mm. uh, a, a real like military or um, a stop where it's much more of a realist uh, a tactic in addressing the issue of terrorism. And bec- and recently, um, Foreign Minister, uh, Law and Foreign Minister um, of Singapore has suggested plans to work together with Malaysia mm-hmm. to s- combat terrorism and especially with a focus on ISIS because... Um, I think when it comes to this threat, it, it goes beyond just education. It's about the, doing more rigorous checking at the immigration counter and, of, co- and of course, uh, having probably more security and military personnel in charge of trying to observe uh, people who, are, who have terrorist, terrorist tendencies. And then not only that, but the, the problem here is each country, what kind of policy do they have to stop uh, uh, inviting or, you know, uh, having ISIS coming in more and more? Because, for example, Indonesia, it is not illegal uh, to fund or join jihad or in other countries. So ISIS is recruiting very openly there. And the, the group propagandas was, it was very uh, widely available and it could be found in the most for moder- moderate uh, all those uh, government uh, the bodies that in Indonesia. So people can just join them freely. With, like, uh, in fact, they are being very smart at this. For example, Muslim terrorists from Malaysia would go to Indonesia mm-hmm. to fly to uh, Syria and also Iraq, yep. while Indonesian Muslim uh, uh, would actually go to Malaysia to fly to um, Syria and Iraq. It shows that uh, this is uh, some of the coy they played in order mm-hmm. f- uh, for for them to avoid the authorities to detect them from and going. Well, since you mentioned that, uh, Mm -hmm. it seems that Malaysia uh, needs to also uh, step up their checks at the immigration, like you mentioned earlier, because Mm -hmm. we seem to be like the the middle point when it comes to uh, these people actually commuting. uh, Well, we are one of the... One of the... (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, we are... We actually... uh, We are at... um, one of the worst countries when, mm. when it comes to human trafficking. So I would agree with you when it comes to trafficking, not just human, but just people volu- voluntarily going to countries that are, that are of high risk. Malaysia would be the central checkpoint, definitely. Well, that's true. And then... 
not to forget that Malaysia actually caught uh, 19 suspects for who uh, who had the links with the extremist group in a, in a, like you know seven months ago. So Malaysia is doing something, but then like we mentioned before, it could be the middle point to just pass to go through other countries mm-hmm. to to be very active for ISIS itself, and also not to forget about the Brunei. <coughs> which is the the region that it has recently imposed uh, the sharia law and also it could be used to encourage encourage the spread of islamic uh, radicalism mm-hmm. at the same time you know you know what is the worst thing the worst thing is now mm-hmm. uh, th- this was reported last year mm-hmm. 200 indonesians and at least 30 malaysians mm-hmm. fighting for isis but now it's reported that it has been increased to 70 malaysian it could be higher than that it mm-hmm. could be higher than mm-hmm. that reporting going to um, countries in Syria and uh, Iraq fighting for ISIS and this include women as we all know the most infamous one is the Malaysian uh, blogger yeah. that actually blocked about her life mm-hmm. uh, being the wife of one of the ISIS uh, militant and she seemed to be happy about it uh, I guess this goes back to uh, all this religious fundamentalism which uh, we will uh, get into as well because uh, for someone to actually get into uh, the whole bandwagon, of course, it doesn't just uh, happen overnight. It's a very long process mm-hmm. of uh, emotions, of psychological changes, or even even your uh, your living conditions, your surrounding, like what we talked about earlier, it can be uh, the economic problems in the country or family problems. And uh, all this goes back uh, to religion, uh, where where most people find comfort in it. So when it comes to religious fundamentalism, uh, when most people resort to that, it seems that ISIS actually uh, provides an answer to these people, that they are actually following this whole religious fundamentalism concept, and that makes them uh, sort of more attractive to these people to actually uh, get into the bandwagon with them. You are right about it. Actually, religious fundamentalism, even before ISIS, is on the rise uh, in countries like Brunei with its Sharia law and with Malaysia with the increased power of uh, Jakim or the religious department in the Prime Minister's office and in Indonesia with pockets of religious mm-hmm. groups and of course in Aceh uh, specifically where the state government has become more and more religious in terms of its mm-hmm. uh, approach towards its uh, society. And in countries where it has uh, separatist groups, the separatist groups turn to religious fundamentalism to seek for the answer of their own identity Mm -hmm. and their own uh, separatist struggles against uh, the government of Philippines when it comes to the Bangsa Moro and of course for the Southern Thai uh, against the Thai government. And uh, there could be a lot of reasons why... uh, religious uh, fundamentalism is growing, uh, probably not only in uh, ASEAN, but uh, all over the world. Mm -hmm. And some of the reasons are like major political changes, or it can be even uh, the policies in the country, like what you guys mentioned about the Sharia law in in Brunei earlier. Mm -hmm. Uh, And all these uh, have usually have a very profound uh, effect on the individual themselves. when when uh, when you have that dissatisfaction uh, feeling inside you and you're constantly uh, being oppressed and there's so much of negativity going on, you want to go back to sort of that that starting point to find mm-hmm. out well, what what uh, all this really is about. Uh, sorry, yeah. Oh no, I was about to say that um, there are specifically four countries from ASEAN. They have uh, mm. who have mentioned about ISIS, what they actually think about. And Malaysia, we I shortly mentioned before, they have uh, they did condemn the action of ISIS in this country. Police are monitoring the social media to pick out the content that used to influence and recruiting people for ISIS. And Singapore, like we mentioned before, uh, they also have condemned ISIS and called their actions very barbar- barbaric. And then government is uh, detaining those flying off to the Syria country. And the Philippines, on the other hand, it says uh, none of uh, its citizens has joined ISIS, but its armed forces are keeping their eyes peeled. And all uh, and moving to Indonesia, Muslim leaders public uh, condemned ISIS and the government uh, criminalized uh, the support for the group. So 
the actions uh, from uh, ASEANs, it's been going on, but then um, the power and the force of ISIS is so overwhelming that uh, still the Southeast Asia regions has to uh, really take into consideration what they can uh, do to step forward to stop them. It's definitely very overwhelming and very cheap to, to actually fight for the cost of ISIS. For example, <coughs> the cost of flight to uh, the Middle East mm-hmm. uh, country in Syria and mm-hmm. also uh, Iraq would probably cost you around 2k to 4k ringgit mm-hmm. and <coughs> to I mean for a typical Malaysian mm-hmm. that is actually quite affordable mm-hmm. um, and in fact some of them are even being uh, sponsored and paid by ISIS in, in terms of their plane ticket and this was reported by experts in Singapore um, he confirmed that um ISIS has definitely ISIS definitely has definitely been recruiting uh, their counterparts in Southeast Asia, and you see the solidarity between Indonesian and Malaysian, where uh, they they were news about um, forming some form of like a Malay. Um, uh, I would say Malay uh, solidarity of ISIS mm-hmm. in um, in the country in Syria and also <coughs> Iraq just to cater towards the Malay speaking group mm-hmm. to support their terrorist uh, ideology. Mm-hmm. So it, it's pretty scary if you look at the uh, It's picture. a very smart move from them how they want to cater for certain groups and to be able to reach out to larger audience. Mm-hmm. And the surprising fact is most of them mm-hmm. are not your typical kampong boy or mm-hmm. people who are just, you know, bluntly followers. They are, they are professionals. Yeah. Uh, for example, some of them would are doctors. They they go there. They fight for the cause of ISIS. At the same time, they set up tents or clinics for uh, injured ISIS yeah. members. So they know what they are doing. It's not like they they just follow because they they they. I mean, it, they were offered to do so. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's not as simple as saying that I'm just doing this because I believe in them. They are doing this mm-hmm. because they know this is the right way to do it, according to their own twisted mindset. I think this is where the whole psychological uh, factor comes in as mm-hmm. well, and also uh, in accordance to what ISIS has been promoting, because their main. Uh, uh, what you call it, their main drive in in that sense is religion. Whether it's right or wrong is is a, is a different story because there are a lot of people who don't agree that that ISIS is actually uh, the epitome of of religious fundamentalism. But they have managed to brand themselves so well and um, sort of market it to the entire world that they can convince pretty much anybody, not just like you mentioned a kampong boy. It could be someone who is very very well educated. Uh, because they say take care of religion and everything else will take care of itself and uh, the way that they do that is so powerful that uh, it's so easy for anyone to to get into the bandwagon and they are convinced that they are actually doing the right thing by joining ISIS they feel like they are are probably one step closer to that uh, fundamentalism that they are striving uh, to 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 achieve Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you go to this website called establishmentpost.com, mm-hmm. uh, the article is called ASEAN Must Get Rid of ISIS in Southeast Asia. Uh, they they have uh, pointers of how many, uh, what uh, I mean, how large the extent of ISIS present in Southeast Asia and it's quite frightening. For example, uh, they have uh, partners with Mo, um, Moro Islamic Liberation Front and another Philippine re- re- rebel group, Moro National Libera- Liberation Front, Al Qaeda affiliated Abu Sayyaf uh, groups. And of course, uh, in Singapore and Malaysia, they have their own uh, network as well. And in fact, uh, uh, they they also have uh, cleric and terrorists like Abu Abu Bakar Bashar that actually preach to support ISIS. And another leader, Jama'ah Ashurut Tawhid, uh, who has actually designated a terrorist organization by the U.S., and also, apparently now there are 500 Indonesian that has already joined ISIS, including one 90-year-old fighter, um, who, um, uh, who 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 you can see, you know, uh, people who are so young, so passionate about life, and they are devoting their own 
uh, ideology and life towards ISIS. And this is how crazy it is. And of course, in Malaysia, you have Mujahideen groups that has mm-hmm. been recruiting Malaysians on the social media. You see, if you go on Facebook, Gary, you you can easily you know find a job for and ISIS. Then, yeah, that's something that <laughs> Gaudi actually mentioned before how they mm-hmm. are using social media in very smartly, mm-hmm. and also one of the the developed Android smartphone they have created this app called the, the Dawn of the Glad Tidings, and then they can. Oh my God, they have an app. Yeah, that's how cool they are, right? It's actually <laughs> being quote. taken down, <laughs> but it was there. So this is how they want to approach the to to have a larger audience, mm-hmm. not only like Facebook or app, but also. By Twitter and YouTube, all kinds of all forms of uh, uh, social media they can and in make all, use of. And they translate it in almost all languages: Filipino, Malay, English, Arabic, French. You name it. Uh, that, that's how advanced they mm-hmm. they know. Uh, you know the recruitment process ought to be. You know they they are so good. We should recruit them for doing that and just to do some form of, uh, I would say, marketing strategy. Yes, it sounds as much as it sounds very sensitive, but it sounds so like a good idea. I was just idea, being sarcastic <laughs> about them in a way because <laughs> they seem to be so good at what they are doing. They are very updated. That yeah, mm-hmm. they are very updated in terms of social media, and you have government agency in Southeast Asia mm-hmm. that are still using you know like old technology to do recruitment and 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 produce stuff. So it shows that they are actually in line with the voices of the younger generation. Mm-hmm. They, they know how to capture the minds of the younger generation and, and that's not good actually. And then this also shows how they are uh, becoming more organized and uh, quite centralized in terms of leadership in the group itself. Mm-hmm. And then that does the, with, the, with the firm facts and the firm ideas they, they are having, uh, the younger generations, they can actually easily be convinced by these groups as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, another thing that uh, I want to bring up, although I'm actually not too clear about this, is uh, the whole Wahhabism movement that's been taking place in Malaysia. Uh, that seems to be uh, playing uh, a part in in recruiting people for an alternative uh, approach as well. Um, maybe Arlene can tell us more about that. <laughs> when I became the spokesperson <laughs> on anything Islam. <laughs> well, the, the, the thing about Wahhabism is, a lot of the countries are actually, uh, and a lot of the terri- terrorist group, they are against Wahhabism as per uh, the brand of Wahhabism as promoted by Saudi Arabia. Because first of all, I mean they are against the idea of monarchy, mm-hmm. and they are against the idea of marrying religion into state as the way Saudi Arabia are doing it. But what is attractive to uh, this terrorist group and to people who are more fundamental is called new. Wahhabism, mm-hmm. meaning that they are taking elements of Wahhabism, the ideology itself, into into um, and interpret it in a way that is very fundamental uh, fundamentalism. So, to to such extent, it's not the Wahhabism that you would identify with Saudi Arabia, but it's neo Wahhabism where they became uh, re- where religion become more fundamentalism, more militant like in a way. And that goes back to the fundament, sorry, fundamentalism and how uh, that seems to be the basis of uh, recruitment or the point of attraction for most people to uh, actually join ISIS. Yeah, definitely. And um, uh, on the other hand, let's talk about the challenges of ASEAN uh, in terms of trying to get rid of ISIS because I don't think right now ASEAN is prepared. And maybe I'm being a bit biased against mm-hmm. ASEAN, but I feel that ASEAN still have a lot of a lot of things they need to address within their own uh, limitation in order for them to be able to completely get rid of ISIS. But what about your the view f- the view of you too? Uh, I th- I think for. Southeast Asia or even Asia itself, uh, speaking in the context of uh, Malaysia, we are not uh, a region that is used to terrorist attacks or or terrorists uh, coming in and also uh, when it comes to something new and as as dangerous as it is, as risky as it is, uh, we do not have uh, 
a concrete plan mm. or a framework as to how to handle this situation, which is why we keep having, uh, we have quite a high number of people uh, joining this and we still don't know how to put a stop to that because it's something that we've never uh, handled before. And of course, that's not uh, an excuse. That's, that's not something that we must overlook. Uh, it's all the more reason for the leaders in this region to come together. And uh, among other pressing issues that we have in this region, uh, this whole thing about ISIS is, is something that needs to be their priority. And uh, uh, ASEAN, they need to work together as ASEAN itself, not just as individual countries to come up with, with a plan on how to put a stop to this because it's getting worse and worse every day. But then uh, to think about to think about ISIS so far, militancy is not something new in ASEAN region. Uh, with a lot of a government system that, that that we have seen, like the changes in government system, it's not something new. But uh, we have never encountered properly when it comes to attack of ISIS uh, to certain countries. And um, it, it's also about the the bringing the awareness to the public, not only via social media, how they have been imposing their themselves also implementing their policies, but how people, as in like our just civils, normal people can actually encounter this problem and also be able to prevent from the future attacks. And that also comes from the high authorities, how they have to uh, educate the people around it and then inform more in the details what what's the steps that we we need to take uh, we need to take forward to uh, make them stop coming to our nations or regions. I totally agree with you, Grace. Remember when we were mm. child, uh, when we were younger, whenever there's some something bad happened, the government will always issue like a PSA, public service announcement mm-hmm. on how mm. to address it. For example, mm. uh, I still remember in the 90s, uh, there were rampant cases of dengue. So uh, I still remember when I was a child, I enjoyed watching the PSA about Eddie's um, mm. a mosquito and how to prevent the breeding of Eddie's mo- mm-hmm. mosquito and all that. And I felt that what is lacking nowadays is a PSA, a very effective one, either online or on TV and on any other me- uh, channels that the government can think of to somehow address uh, several issues, not just on ISIS, mm-hmm. but on religious fundamentalism mm-hmm. and on uh, what kind of ASEAN that we want. Uh, right now, what it seems to be, ISIS is doing the PR job in terms yeah. of recruitment, mm-hmm. but there's no counter PR mm-hmm. job in terms of why we should not join ISIS, why ISIS is a terrorist group instead of a religious group that is promoting uh, religious values. And what kind of uh, Islam, or not just Islam, or re- but I guess in essence uh, values that we want to adhere to as a citizen or as a community in Southeast Asia, there is very much lacking. Mm. So far until now, I haven't seen even a single anti-terrorism PSA um, on any channel, uh, whether it's uh, mainstream media or even social media. Well, uh, one of the examples that happened in France is that via the, the drawings, mm. they were quite sarcastic about the group. But however, perhaps in an uh, ASEAN context, perhaps people are, people are a bit more scared about the, what will come you know, once they release to the public. They probably feel like if they do a PSA, people will be more <laughs> aware of ISIS and, and probably want to research more about them. And in that way, it could counter affect uh, the people. That or, sounds or the like the argument of people who are against sex education. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good Pretty example. Much like yeah. That. Yeah. I, I totally disagree. I think the more awareness mm. you have, the less you would incline mm-hmm. to do it uh, or to be on it because you know the consequences of how it would affect not just yourself but your family, your network and in the larger scale, the society that you are in. Mm-hmm. Well, like, uh, for example, in Singapore, they've actually uh, started detaining people who want to fly off to Syria. And that is, of course, a very uh, extreme uh, measure, but uh, that is their take on it. Whereas in Indonesia, uh, I think they are starting to also ban YouTube videos, uh, Mm -hmm. any video at all that has the keyword ISIS. And we can probably start doing the same by... uh, 
taking these countries as example. Perhaps <laughs> they need to create like ASEAN or international campaign. You know, it, it, I mean, definitely a regional mm-hmm. campaign would be definitely important. But I feel that one of the key problem I, uh, that is a challenge to ASEAN is it's too slow. Mm-hmm. In fact, if I would, I would be in charge. I would tell them. Why are you so slow? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Be fast. <laughs> Think quick. <laughs> Because whatever decision that is made at the regional level seems to take um, so many rounds of ministerial talks. Mm-hmm. And all these talks, you know, cost time. And time is actually very vo- um, very um, valuable, at the, uh, especially, you know, what we see in how the government of Japan failed mm-hmm. to address its own hostage issue yep. at which you know lead to the uh, unfortunate uh, beheading of uh, Kenji Goto yep and uh, like you mentioned like uh, while we are having a lot of talks and a discussion mm-hmm. they could be the one that all those ISIS people could be the one who can actually be more proactive towards the, their uh, mm-hmm. to achieve their goals. Who knows? The next victim could mm-hmm. be from Southeast Asia, or it could be from Malaysia itself. That, that would be so scary. I mean, I'm not sure it would be from Malaysia since ringgit currency is quite low. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> They might not get enough value right. out of Malaysia. <laughs> yeah, but it could be from Southeast Asia in a way. Definitely. Um, they would get a hostage mm-hmm. from the, mm-hmm. this country and then they would ask for ransom money and how are we able to address that I, do, I don't think there's any um, uh, what is what do you call it um, contingency plan to mm-hmm. actually address this mm-hmm. and uh, going back to what we were saying earlier ASEAN is being too slow in this and like Grace mentioned if ISIS is more proactive in actually uh, spreading their influence or getting in touch with, with more people we will be the one losing out eventually because the next victim could be from anywhere they're, they're, they don't seem to be slowing down they're actually quite consistent uh, in in their uh, attacks uh, in their uh, spreading of, of information and all and if we want to uh, combat this, the first thing to do is to move faster. To move faster. If there's one thing that I would probably um, advise ASEAN governments in order for them to be able to um, counter ISIS, um, of course uh, early on we talk about the PSA and all that, but I think on on, on the larger scale is to improve the security measures mm. in Southeast Asia. I think The recent talks is definitely very positive, but on a larger scale, it has to penetrate in every level where you would not have anyone from Southeast Asia joining ISIS at all. Um, and because the numbers are telling, it shows that more and more people from uh, uh, are joining ISIS and nothing much has been done to address this other than talks. Actually, one is good enough to join the, the ISIS and to be able to spread the words and mm-hmm. also the actions about it. And if the number is increasing more and more, it's definitely something that government really needs to consider about this matter, not just because, okay, this this uh, country, it had it's this issue regarding ISIS, it's miles away from oh, um, my country. It shouldn't be in that way. They really need to take into consideration and to make a step forward at least regarding this matter so that's all for our news today uh, sorry our Monday morning <laughs> matters today uh, relating to ISIS terrorism and of course how ASEAN should respond to this thank you this is Arlene signing off this is Gauri and this is Grace